The University of Wisconsin La Crosse Murphy Library Special Collections and Area Research Center is located in a separate dedicated space within Murphy Library. You can find its entrance on the main floor of the library's atrium area. It has its own door with a sign above it that says Special Collections and Area Research Center. To get in, just ring the doorbell. Press firmly until you hear a ding. Listen for the buzzer and then pull back the handle. Once you enter, you will be greeted at the registration area. If it's your first time visiting, there is a registration form to fill out. It has the archive's general rules and procedures at the top, and you put your contact information at the bottom. It is sort of like applying for a library card. These forms help us track general user data so we can make informed decisions about services, allow us to find people in case something goes missing, and provide contact information if we find something that might further someone's research. You only have to fill out the registration form on your first visit. On subsequent visits, all you have to do is sign into our daily guest book. To protect the resources, we ask that everyone leave any food and drink, jackets, book bags, and pens in the entrance area behind the half wall. There are hangers, lockers, and chairs for holding personal items. You can bring in pencils, paper, notebooks, computers, tablets, headphones, cell phones, and the like inside. Once you get signed in, you can take a seat at any open table. Hi. Welcome to the University of Wisconsin La Crosse Murphy Library Special Collections and Area Research Center Archives. My name is Laura Godden and I'm an archivist here and I work here alongside my colleague Paul Beck. Hi, I'm Paul Beck. I'm the Special Collections Librarian and La Crosse Area Research Center Director. Also working here are approximately 10 UWL student archive assistants. They help researchers with questions, retrieve and reshell materials, and work on various projects involving the historic materials here. Many of our student archivists applied for this campus job in order to gain real-world, hands-on experience that would aid them in attending grad school or getting a job in the cultural heritage field or a related area after graduation. At this point, you might be asking yourself, what exactly is a Special Collections? Special Collections is generally a term used to describe a unit in a library where more unique and sometimes historic books and materials are kept. Typically, materials in this part of a library cannot be checked out and are instead viewed within the specially designated library area. In informal conversation, I tend to use the terms special collections, area research center, and archives interchangeably to describe our library's unit, as we have materials that fit all three of those names. Some examples of items that we have include letters and diaries, maps, rare literature books, photographs, local publications, student papers, and much more. You can find both primary and secondary sources on our shelves. Many of the items have some sort of connection to the area. Some were created by people from here, while others were collected by them and then donated to our holdings. A decent amount of material contains information about UWL and the La Crosse region. Many of the items we house would be difficult, if not impossible, to replace and they sometimes require special handling and care. However, a common misconception is that everything we have here is old. We also gather newly created records for the researchers of tomorrow. Basically, our work involves collecting, organizing, describing, and preserving materials of long-term, enduring historical significance and making them accessible to researchers and for instruction purposes on campus. We are open to both members of the UWL campus and the general public. This part of the library is not just for history majors. For example, art students come in to see examples of different photograph types and interact with handmade artist books. A rec class views resources to understand the evolution of tourism. Racket reporters examine materials for investigative reporting. English majors seek out first editions and other uncommon books, small fine and private presses, student work, and Midwest poetry and creative writing, as well as drafts of writers' works. Historical information and images are frequently used by marketing professionals in advertising. Geologists have an interest in our map collection. And biologists even gather contextual information about a former gun range, like when, where, and how it operated, which they used to further studies on pollution caused by lead ammunition in the La Crosse River Marsh. In the next part of this video, I'll take you on a short tour of where our materials are stored. Normally, researchers don't get to go in the back areas, 
Like many archives, we have what are called closed stacks, which means that staff go and get materials for researchers. We do this for a couple of reasons. One, because of the uniqueness of the items, the organization is often less standardized and more creative than in the main part of the library, so it would be difficult for an average person to find things. It typically takes our student employees about a semester to get a handle on where things are. Two, if an item is particu particularly fragile or has special handling requirements, like needing gloves, staff can more easily inform researchers about those things. In the stacks on the east side of the building is where our rare books are kept. If you were taking this tour in person, one of the first things you would notice when entering the stacks area is a drop in temperature. Our storage areas have environmental controls designed to facilitate long-term preservation, like cooler temperatures and immunity controls. They are, they are also in place in the reading room, but they are more distinct in the stacks. There is also a lack of windows in the stacks, and we turn off the lights when they are not in use, because exposure to light can cause materials to fade over time. This is also why we ask people to turn off the flash on their camera before taking photos of documents. One of the most common questions we get asked is what is the oldest book here? It is a book from 1518 that is written in Latin. It isn't common for us to have stuff like this. If you think about it, 1518 was long before Wisconsin even became a state and is really only a few years after Europeans started traveling to the Americas. It was most likely donated to us by a professor who had an interest in the topic. As I mentioned before, most of our materials have a stronger tie to the area. This is what is of most interest to our users and what is most readily around for us to collect. This topic is also something that other archives around the world are not collecting. Basically, if the archives in this area don't save and preserve its history, who will? So in this vein, we have many regional and Wisconsin history books. Some of them are secondary sources, while others are primary sources. There are general books on Wisconsin and lacrosse history. There are also publications that focus on particular businesses, churches, organizations, people, and places. We also have published reports and newsletters from various government agencies, businesses, and groups. We also have vertical files on various local topics, people, businesses, organizations, and places. Some archives call these clipping files because they generally contain a lot of newspaper and magazine article clippings. But they could also contain pamphlets and artifacts that per for practical purposes are too small to catalog and give a call number to like a typical book. Vertical files on some subjects may contain a lot of materials, while others might only contain one thing. Hopefully looking at these often irreplaceable resources helps make it clear why we don't allow pens. It would be a real tragedy to have a pen's ink explode or get smeared on something. We prefer pencils because they don't leak and marks from unintentional contact can typically be erased. Some of the more unexpected materials in our holdings include little magazine publications, early science fiction, Midwest contemporary poetry, and artists and fine press books. While looking at our books, you might have noticed the little bookmarks sticking out of them. These acid-free paper streamers are what we put the book's call number on because we don't want to place stickers on them like the books in the main part of the library. We also have large items like these maps. Some have been encapsulated in plastic to protect them. They are stored in these big map cabinet drawers. There are also older books and materials that were transferred here from the main part of the library collection as they now have more historic significance, like these life magazines. Don't let the red hardcovers fool you. These are the same as the typical life magazine issues that you have probably seen before. Sometimes libraries get things like this bound together in order to protect them from getting torn, keep them in order by date, and make them easier to shelve and move. Perhaps the thing we are best known for in the community are our photograph collections. They contain both historic and contemporary images of UWL and the La Crosse area, as well as smaller amounts of photos of various cities in Wisconsin, the U.S., and the world. There are also postcards and stereo views in the collection. For some places and subjects, we have a lot of photos. For others, we have just a few. And for some, we have none. The archive is very dependent on donations. So if no one donated anything on a given subject matter, we might not have anything. When handling the photographs, we ask that researchers wear cotton gloves to protect them from fingerprints and deterioration caused by the oils found on everyone's hands. Sometimes special collections and archives 
have a specialty collection area. Ours is photographs of inland river steamboats. This collecting area ties to La Crosse because it was and still is a popular port on the Mississippi River for steamboats. With over 30,000 images, we think we have one of the largest collections of steamboat photographs in the world. People from places far and wide contact us about it. This collection came into being because volunteer Ralph Dupe and librarian Ed Hill made a concerted effort to identify and gather these images for many, many years. To support our steamboat photograph collection, we also collect publications about steamboats. Now that we have covered the materials stored on the east side of the building, let's continue our tour in the stacks on the west side. Over here, we will see archival manuscript collections, county level government records, and materials related to UWL. We have a multitude of items connected to the university, such as copies of the Racket student newspapers, yearbooks, meeting minutes for some committees, photographs, university reports, newsletters, class catalogs, alumni magazines and other publications, and vertical files on general topics, people, organizations, and buildings. We also have most of the UWL student theses from over the years, as well as a selection of UWL student papers from a handful of classes, like the History and Archaeology capstone courses. Additionally, our archive serves as the public repository for interviews conducted by the UWL Oral History Program. Founded in 1968, there are hours upon hours of OHP recordings and transcripts covering topics local to national. Some popular interviews focus on UWL experiences, the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, Lacrosse and Mississippi River history, and Hmong immigrants talking about experiences in the Vietnam War and relocating to the Midwest. While working in archives, you might encounter dated forms of technology. For example, many of the oral histories were originally recorded on reel-to-reel -reel tape, and the collection of lacrosse newspapers that we have, which dates back to the 1850s and 60s, is preserved on microfilm. One reason why our archive is so robust is due to our affiliation with the Wisconsin Historical Society. We are part of a network of 13 area research centers located throughout the state at UW Schools and the Northern Great Lakes Visitor Center, where high quality WHS materials are deposited. Our ARC has materials originating from La Crosse and four surrounding counties, Monroe, Trempolo, Jackson, and Vernon. The network was established in order to place archival collections in locations closer to where they originally came from, as that is where they would most likely receive the most use. Most WHS and ARC original primary source archival materials can be temporarily transferred to any facility in the network for use in their reading room, as long as the items aren't too large or fragile to travel. Anyone can make a transfer request by speaking to an archivist and there is no cost to do so. It typically takes about a week for materials to arrive, and they can normally stay for about a month. The ARC materials housed here fall under two general categories. The first is county-level government records. These can be items like pre-1907 birth, marriage, and death records, court dockets and minutes, tax rolls, and even naturalization records because people used to be able to apply for citizenship at county level courts. The records that we have for each county varies. This is because some records were lost or destroyed before there were provisions requiring their preservation and transfer to WHS, while other records are still located and housed at the county offices that created them. The second main ARC category is manuscript collections, which are different from book manuscripts. These are collections of groups of records originating from a common creator like a private individual, politician, business, church, civic group or organization, labor union, or an institution like a private school. Some examples of manuscript collections in our holdings include the Hickson Family Papers, who are prominent lumber business owners in La Crosse, the Business and Professional Women's Club, the La Crosse Music Study Club, the Henry Bliss Papers, who was a surveyor, civil engineer, and land agent in La Crosse, the La Crosse Trades and Labor Council records, the Marion Havoc Papers, who was an environmentalist that was best known for studying mollusks in the Upper Mississippi River region, 
and the Odin J. Odin Records, which was a prominent interior design firm in the late 1800s and early 1900s based out of La Crosse. That manuscript collection contains many watercolor renderings of their work. Manuscript collections typically contain primary sources like letters and other correspondence, membership and mailing lists, diaries, account books and ledgers, newsletters, scrapbooks, memos, reports, notes, meeting minutes, photographs, and other various records. The very first thing in a manuscript collection's first box should be a finding aid, which are also sometimes called registers or inventories. They let the researcher know what person or group the records originate from, who donated them and when, what years the materials cover, and the size of the collection, which can range from a single folder to thousands of boxes. Finding aids also include a short biography or history of the creator and an abstract about the records, which often reveals what you might expect to find in the collection, information on why the material was created, or insights regarding the arrangement of the materials within the boxes. Lastly, finding aids provide a breakdown of the collection's contents by box and folder which acts sort of like a table of contents for the collection. You may be wondering, why did these groups of records come into existence, and how did they get here in our archives? We all make records in our everyday life. Think about some of the paperwork you keep for things like your university studies, or the organizations that you belong to. You might keep papers about the licensing and health care of your pets, or files of tax records. My desk drawer, for example, is full of lesson plans for classes that come and visit special collections in the Area Research Center. Maybe one day, it could be useful as an archival manuscript collection documenting various types of research instruction and potentially useful to those studying the history of university education. Personal documents, just like those found in official archival collections, are a record of something that happened, and as such, they can give insights about how and why an event occurred. However, as any archivist can tell you, not all records are worthy of long-term preservation. It is doubtful that the historians of tomorrow will care about your pet getting a rabies shot, but something like the records of your parents' small family farm operation might be. It is estimated that archives only preserve about 1 or 2 percent of all the records ever created. Typically, there comes a point when records get so old or outdated they are no longer of regular use for the purpose that they were created for to the people or agency that created them. But, despite this, they might contain a wealth of historical information and thus become useful for this new reason. Sometimes, when people recognize this situation, the records are donated to an archive. Generally, there are some things you would be less likely to find in a publicly accessible archive. For example, the records of a still active business, or proprietary information, like Coca-Cola's soda recipe. However, stuff like that is probably preserved in private company archives accessible to employees. Besides intellectual property, people often do not donate records that are personally embarrassing to them or their family, or that might expose them to legal issues. Archivists do worry about people selectively removing records before donating them. Additionally, archives are often more likely to have records from those of a higher socioeconomic status, and less likely to have records of historically underrepresented people. The vast majority of archivists are actively working to reverse these trends, but it is a slow process impacted by many widespread societal forces. However, it's an important issue because what records get saved, and which do not, have a strong impact on what perspectives shape widely accepted, and published historical narratives. When archivists receive a donation of records, much work needs to be done to ready them for researchers. If the records have been in storage, sometimes they require cleaning. Archivists almost always rehome the materials in acid-free archival boxes and folders for long-term preservation. If records come in in disarray, archivists will perform tasks like grouping like materials, such as letters, financials, and press releases together and then sorting them by date to make them easier for historians to find and use. Sometimes archivists choose to keep the records in mostly the same arrangement in which they arrived in order to preserve the creator's original order. This is because, if there is a logical arrangement, 
That in itself is a form of historical information and provides insight about their creation and how they were originally used. The order materials are in can also provide important contextual information. For example, information on one document might help a record following it make more sense. In fact, the second record might not be very useful without the information on the document before it, so it can be very important to keep certain materials together. This is why when looking through folders in archival manuscript collections, it is important that researchers keep the pages in order. Archives keep materials together by creator because knowing who made a record and why is essential to understanding it. For example, historians would approach a document about environmental regulation from a conservation group very differently than they would one on the same topic from an industrial lobbyist. A downfall of organizing materials by creator is that there could be numerous places to find records on the same topic. For example, the Menninger papers contain documents about Hmong immigration, but there are also several more places to find information on that topic in our collection, like in oral histories, vertical files, primary and secondary books, published reports, student papers, photographs, and naturalization records, to name a few. Another tricky aspect is that a collection's connection to a topic might not be readily apparent just from its name. For example, if you were looking for information on Wisconsin's early logging industry, you might not necessarily know to look in the Hickson family papers based on that name alone. However, this is why archivists put together finding aids and make them searchable online in library catalogs. Also, researchers should keep in mind that a single collection can contain information on various topics. For example, in addition to Hmong immigration, the Menninger papers contain records on topics like cigarette vending machines, the death penalty, fireworks, fallout shelters, the legal drinking age, gambling, zebra mussels, and more, because these are all things he was concerned about as a mayor and state representative. Sometimes, when looking for information in an archive, it's helpful to think about who would have compiled information or been concerned about the topic that you were looking for. To help people search for and find materials in the Murphy Library Special Collections and ARC Archives, we have compiled a written research guide with instructions. The main way to find archival materials is through the UWL Murphy Library Catalog, Search at UW. Library catalog entries are short descriptions of items in the library's collection. In a library catalog, you can use keyword searching to find resources on a specific topic that you can then seek out in person for research use. In Search at UW, notice that you have the option to limit your search to just archives and special collections by using the drop-down menu after the search bar. However, since this is a shared catalog across the entire UW system, you will also likely see search results from special collections and archives at other UW schools. If you want to limit your findings to just materials available at UWL, after searching you can use the Available at My Library limiter found on the left-hand side of the screen under the heading Show Only. If you are looking for information on a very specific topic, though, it might be a good idea to start out searching the entire UW system because, as you may remember, WHS materials at other ARCs can often be transferred to our facility for use here. One thing to keep in mind is not everything we have can be found in Search at UW because a small amount of our materials have not been cataloged yet like our photograph collection and UWL vertical files. However, we do have paper lists of these items that you can look at if you visit in person. An online catalog that you can use to search for just archival manuscript collections is the University of Wisconsin Digital Collections Archival Resources in Wisconsin Descriptive Finding Aids. It includes materials at our facility, WHS, and other ARC archives. While these materials are also cataloged in Search at UW, it's a good idea to search on this website too, because Search at UW only includes short descriptions of manuscript collections and not their entire finding aid. So if you only use Search at UW, you might miss out on a lot of potential records. For example, if you searched for any of the topics that I mentioned during the Mettinger papers earlier using Search at UW, the collection would not show up because those topics are listed in the Finding Aids content list. However, if you search for those same topics in the Archival Resources in Wisconsin website, the Menninger papers would appear 
because that catalog searches the entire finding aid and not just the short description of the collection. We have a lot of resources and the vast majority have not been digitized, so to see them, you need to visit the archive in person. However, there is a sizable amount of material that has been scanned and made accessible online via the Murphy Library Digital Collections website. This is helpful because not only can you view these materials at any time from the comfort of your own home, but also because you can search the entire full text of documents. On Murphy Library Digital Collections, you will find things like UWL yearbooks, Racket student newspapers, various publications related to UWL and lacrosse's history, maps, wood and oyen interior design renderings, UWL theater posters and playbills, some lacrosse photographs and oral histories, and much more. You can also access many of our digitized resources on the Lacrosse History Unbound website. This is a shared website that features digitized resources related to lacrosse's history from both our archive and the Lacrosse Public Library archives. It is useful because it conveniently breaks down resources by broad topics, which makes them much easier to browse. This can be especially helpful if you're trying to pick a topic for a research project. When looking for archival resources, it's always a good idea to first try searching yourself to get a sense of what's out there and what direction you want to go. If you need help after your preliminary search, the archivists and their student assistants are happy to help you refine your search, connect you with any on-catalog material, and offer suggestions. In addition to a research guide, we have also created a citation help pamphlet that is specific to the resources that we have here in our archive. High schools don't typically have an archive, so college is many people's first in-depth introduction to one. As such, one of our educational goals is to try and make students aware of some of the advantages and benefits of using archival materials in research. Moreover, we think that UWL students have an exceptionally great opportunity here, as most regional teaching-focused universities don't have a robust archive with such a vast multitude of resources like we do. Lots of college archives mainly just have a bulk of university records, if they have an archive at all. Lastly, we aren't aware of any other places with a statewide archival record transfer system like Wisconsin has, and that really opens the door to a vast amount of access to world-class WHS material. Here at Special Collections and the Area Research Center, we work really hard to connect researchers with historical documents which they can handle and interpret themselves. These materials are often used to publish research in books and journal articles, complete assignments, write news or magazine stories, produce documentaries, restore historic buildings, produce public history projects, or hold events like a downtown history day. You may have already seen some of our materials on display around campus and in the community, or in publications in the local media. For example, if you have been up to Grandad's Bluff, the signs about its history were researched here. Our materials have also been sought out by various national and international entities. Some examples include Ken Burns for his Mark Twain documentary, the PBS History Detectives TV show, the U.S. Postal Service for historic stamps, the Travel Channel, BBC, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Smithsonian, and the Olympic Museum in Switzerland. Students and professors also use our materials for public history projects in the community. One example of this is the Hear Here project in downtown La Crosse. This project hangs orange street signs around town with a telephone number on them that passerbys are encouraged to call in order to listen to a short oral history about the very place that they are standing. For this project, students use our resources to research possible histories to feature and it also sources parts of UWL oral history program interviews from our archives. There are many advantages to UWL students using archival resources in their studies. Namely, this first-hand research promotes active learning, and students gain experience working in the same hands-on manner as professionals. Primary sources are the stuff history is made out of. They provide first-hand data and evidence from the time period under study. Students using them for research gain a better understanding of the past, the discipline of history, and how historical narratives are formed. 
UWL students have the advantage of having many unique primary sources available to them without even leaving campus. There are lots to choose from, and many haven't been widely studied before. Interpreting them can be much more meaningful than summarizing well-known work on something like the causes of World War II, like a million students have already done. Archival resources offer the chance to create new knowledge, expose new perspectives, and contribute to the study of a topic. They can make your work stand out from among your peers, as well as open doors to many opportunities available to undergraduates conducting original research, like scholarships, grants, presentations at academic conferences like the National Conference for Undergraduate Research, and publications anywhere from the local newspaper to an academic journal. These experiences all build your resume and could lead to internships and job offers. Honestly, it's just a special perspective altering experience to have documents that are 50, 100, 150, 200 plus years old in your hands. It can be pretty powerful when you realize you are holding something that someone like Booker T. Washington wrote and held over 100 years prior. While digitized materials are great, there is just no substitute for interacting with original documents physically, in person, where you often pick up on subtleties about them that otherwise might be missed. Something important to keep in mind is even though most of the materials in our archive typically relate to the area somehow, they can also connect to statewide, national, and international topics like government policy, wartime experiences, environmental issues and concerns, the experiences of people of color, women, and LGBTQ individuals, for example. In addition to informing you about the archival resources available on campus, this introduction video is also designed to supply you with some cultural capital. So even if you don't end up visiting our facility, you'll know the basics and what to expect if you visit another archive as much of this is generally applicable to most archives. After learning more about this area of the library, though, hopefully you will visit or check out some of the digitized materials online. If you do come see us in person, please keep in mind that we have shorter hours than the main part of the library. During the academic year, when classes are in session, we are open Monday through Friday from 9.30 a.m. to noon. Then we close for lunch, after which we reopen from 1 to 5 p.m. We are closed on weekends and holidays, and during university intercession periods like summer, January J-term, and spring break, we typically have reduced hours. If you do end up using any of our archival materials in the production of an intellectual product, like a paper, a poster, a video, a PowerPoint presentation, or some other type of project or assignment, then you become eligible for the George Gilkey Special Collections Research Scholarship. It is an annual scholarship of $500 that is open to all UWL students. It is named in honor of UWL history professor and archives user and advocate, George Gilkey. Applying for the scholarship is pretty easy. All you need to do is upload a copy of the project that made use of the archival materials and fill out the basic UWL Foundation Scholarship form if you haven't already done so. You don't have to submit any additional essays, letters of recommendation, or anything else like that. This scholarship is designed to reward you for work that you've already done. Like most other UWL Foundation scholarships, applications are typically due shortly before the start of the spring semester. This concludes our Introduction to Archives and UWL Murphy Library Special Collections and Area Research Center Tour. Hopefully you learned some new things and became more interested in using the resources here in your research. Please feel free to visit or contact us via our email. Thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you soon.